themes that you see um, as we go through. And uh, I'll give you a little hint about one, which is going to be the major one, verse 1 and verse 9. But this is the whole of the psalm, and I'm going to start with uh, to the choir master, because that's actually in the original text. To the choir master, according to the Giddeth, a psalm of David. So this is uh, a psalm of David. O Lord, O Yahweh, our Adonai, O Lord, our Lord, O Yahweh, our master, our um, sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, O Yahweh, our Adonai, O Lord, O Yahweh, our Master, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So we're looking at Psalm 8 right now, page 450, if you're going to look in your pew Bible, and then on your phone or wherever else, Psalm 8. So we're looking at themes. What is, what are some of the themes, one of the themes, just, there's no wrong answer, there's just lots of things going on here, but uh, what do you see? I see the foreshadowing of Christ at the right hand of the Father. Okay, foreshadowing of Christ, absolutely. Uh, reflected in the book of Hebrews. Okay. So certainly old, uh, New Testament writers, the writer of Hebrews is going to find Christ. This is actually a messianic psalm. Uh, and I'm actually going to maybe try to go through some of these for our prayer times going forward. I'm trying to figure all that out. But this one uh, I, I wanted to look at because it's uh, we looked at Psalm 1, we've looked at Psalm 46, we've done some other things. So uh, there's Messianic Psalm. Uh, what, uh, so Christ foreshadowing, what else? Awe and praise. Awe and praise. Yeah. Like God is glorious and majestic. Uh, do you know what the word glory means in the Old Testament? Was it his presence? Um, no, it, 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 he's going to be present, but in, in what capacity? His splendor. His splendor. When we think of splendor, what do we think about? Majestic. Majestic. We think of beauty, we think of light, we think of all these types of things, but glory has more to do with a mountain than it has to do with light. Light seemed to be like, you know, uh, light and, uh, uh, you know, it reveals or whatever, uh, but glory has to do with heaviness. It's the word kavod. Mm -hmm. And, and what it means is that God matters like a mountain or an elephant sitting on your chest. <clears throat> so he's the one who is the weightiest, i.e. the most substantial person in the universe. So if we were to look at like all the things, I, you know, you can look at... Uh, uh, you know, balsa wood versus pine versus oak, you know, those types of things you think, you know, what's hardwood? What's going to be the best to build your house out of or a boat out of or burn in your fireplace? I mean, like, what's substantial? Or what, what do you want to, you know, build your house out of? you want to build it out of straw uh, so that the big bad wolf can huff and puff and blow your house down? No, you want it to be made of brick, you know? And God is a brick house, right? He's like, he's immovable. 
by any of the forces that exist. So a hurricane couldn't blow him over, a tornado couldn't blow him over, a uh, solar wind can't blow him over, the worst of the worst of the worst can't move God because he's kavod. He's weighty. He matters. He is the primary, substantial force and power and being in the universe. In fact, all other things he blows away with his breath, with his word. Okay, so it, that's that's something to think about. Like, oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth? You have set your kavod, your glory, your majesty, and it'll include all these other things above the heavens. Okay, the glory is that in, in Hebrew? Yes. So the word kavod is the Hebrew word that we have in our English says in glory, kavod. Right? So even in the, uh, a lot of times Hebrew words have embedded in their, um, the syllables, a hardness, k, v, d, right? Those are hard consonants, whereas, uh, the word for spirit and wind is ruach. Yeah, so it's a, a blowing out. And kavod is this heavy, weighty something. It's not true across, but it is in those particular kinds of words. So it's just embedded in when the Hebrews were speaking these words or reading these words, they felt as well as heard the weightiness of the being of God. So, God's glory, where is it? Is it low, middle? No, it's high. It's the highest. It's above the heavens. So, if you looked at the new telescope, uh, I can't think of the, Webb, Webb, James Webb, the telescope, that they just sent out and getting these pictures back. And they've got the old pictures from the Hubble, and now they've got the James Webb pictures of the same places. Oh my goodness. Go wherever, on Google, YouTube, or whatever, and look at these pictures. They're unreal. It's not just used to, they'd be like, look, the, the you know, like when you go out at night and you see uh, on a dark night, a clear night, you see all the stars. Just this many of them. <laughs> and it's not really stars most of the time. It's galaxies. Uh -huh. What they thought were stars are actually galaxies. It's, it's mind-boggling. And so when I was reading this and studying this, I just thought about, like, God has set his glory above <clears throat> all of these discoveries that we're finding out with this new technology. God is always more substantial than anything in his creation. You know, in the beginning, <laughs> God created the heavens and the heavens. The top, the bottom, and he's over all because he's glorious and majestic, right? So that is verse 1. He set his glory above the heavens. And then verse 9, he set his glory, and therefore his majesty, his glory, his, um, his beauty, his splendor, and all this thing uh, in all the earth, in all the heavens, the heavens, the earth, the glory of God, and that's a mirrorism. Uh, that's a technical term. It's like heaven and earth, and here you see it here, heaven and earth. All right. Now, verse 2. Um, verse 2 is bizarre. It's really a strange, weird something. So I want to read verse 1, starting with, O Lord, our Lord. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens out of the mouth of babies and infants. You have established strength. 
because of your foes to the, to steal the enemy and the avenger. It's kind of a weird, out of the blue type of mindset going on. And so what I want you to see in this particular passage as we're foreshadowing Christ is that God is glorious and powerful. He is weighty and substantial. But he can use the lowest and the smallest uh, and the lightest things to accomplish his will. And so here, God has set his own glory in the heavens and God can use babies and infants, right, to silence his foes. So he demonstrates his power in the establishment of all that's been made. And he sits above and over it, and the earth is a footstool. And this same powerful, omnipotent God silences his foes with the weakest people that we know or that we think are the weakest people. So God will silence his foes and his enemies and these avengers with the mouths of babies. Goo goo, da da, dad da, mama. And God is saying, I will use Talia and Moira and Samuel to silence my foes because I am that strong. <coughs> They're not that strong, but I will use them to defeat my enemies. Sin, death, the devil. Whatever opposes God, whatever antichrists are around, God can use the smallest and the weakest to destroy his enemies. And can you imagine how Satan feels about that very truth? Oh, he must be pulling his hair out. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and then for the church to say, we don't feel strong. We feel very weak. We feel like we have no power. We don't feel like we have a vote. We don't feel like we have a say. And God says, I will establish you to accomplish my will despite your inefficiencies, despite your weaknesses. I'll use babies and infants. I'll use weak churches. I'll use small people. I don't need movie stars. I don't need billionaires. I am going to defeat my foes and I'm going to defeat them with weak people. Why were the Jews God's chosen people? The smallest. <laughs> the smallest and the weakest. <laughs> and as we read, <laughs> the most cantankerous and you know, and God just says, look, this is the way that I work. If you're vain and you're fucked up, I will pull you down. Pull you down. If you're humble and teachable and malleable in my hand, I will exalt you. But I will use whom I will use. I will, um, I mean, that's it. Like, I am who I am, and I will exalt who I want to exalt, and I'll pull down who I want to pull down. And for, for humble people, for babies, for infants, for you and for me, we're going to say, amen. There's hope for us. There's hope for us in the providence of God to make a difference. Okay? So, verse 2 is this kind of out of the blue. Now let's go to verse 3. Before you go. Yeah. They, uh, I don't want to see if you go and mention it, but Jesus cited that verse mm -hmm. in Matthew to the scribes and Pharisees when the children were saying, Hosanna to, uh, to the Son of David. Yeah, absolutely. If you're not read yeah. that verse, then it's yeah, it's not. It's not just quoted. It's Jesus quoted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know it. I know it. It's just like, oh, so amazing. Thank you for reminding me of that. I read that and I forgot to. Uh, it's changed a little bit, but out of the mouths of infants and uh, nurses, babies, uh, you have prepared praise. Yes. Yeah. What he said in the ESV. Yeah, 
and, and so that's what, you know, because this is a messianic song, um, as Anthony said, look, foreshadowing Christ, then Christ says it, and then the writer of Hebrews looks mm -hmm. back to it. So you've got this all-encompassing uh, Psalm 8 all over the place in the Bible. So it's, it's a beautiful thing. So we've looked at you know Psalm 1, we've looked at uh, Psalm 46, we've looked at Psalm 110, we look at Psalm 8. It's just, and Jesus said, you know, all these things that have been written about me. So like as we're reading these things, like do you see how God in his glory and his majesty and in the way that he likes to do things because he's a humble God, he's a powerful God, the all-powerful God, but he's humble. He's gentle and lowly. Right? Jesus says that about himself. There is nothing ungodly in that statement. God is gentle and lowly. Jesus is gentle and lowly. It got nothing to do with impurity and righteousness or sinfulness. It's just his nature. He, he has uh, complete sufficiency in himself. And what's he going to do with all that power? He's going to bless, give, minister, love, serve, because it's his nature. And the more like God we become, we begin to, in our strength, use our strength to give, serve, bless, minister, you know, protect the weak. Provide for, because that's what God's like. And now, verse 3, he goes back, and uh, now he's going to go back in this big, huge section. Heavens, work of your fingers, moon and stars, God set in place. What do you think about that? When I think about the James Webb Telescope and all the galaxies, are they the work of God's big, giant, quad muscles or his big giant biceps you know or his lats or his deltoids you know or his pecs or what no he's just like mm -hmm. yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> it's just like bink. Yep. so easy so easy for God right um, it's the work of his fingers so he's made the heavens, he's made the earth, he uses babies, he creates everything, and it's so super simple for our all-powerful God who literally just breathes out power, authority, dominion, mm -hmm. glory, sun, moon, stars, galaxies, all that type of stuff. And then... And then we go, now we go back to the idea of babies and infants. First form, what is man? That you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him. And so now you begin to see how these things are being weaved together. God uses weak things, insignificant things, powerless things to accomplish his will. He can use his little... He can use his little pinky finger and make the universe. And he can use babies and infants to defeat his foes. And he can use, and this is mankind, it's not going to be men, it's mankind, um, to verse 6, you've given him dominion over the works of your hands. And you have put all things under his feet. And now you begin to see that God will use man to rule and reign over the things that he has made. Insignificant man. Made from the dust. Breathed into with the breath of life. To actually rule, verse 7, all sheep and oxen and beasts of the field, verse 8, birds of the heaven, fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. 
So what God is saying is, look, I'm in control of all things. I own all things. I'm above all things. I rule over all. But I'm going to use babies and infants. And I'm going to use men and women in my rule over my creation. And as Anthony mentioned, this is uh, a Messianic psalm. And it's really going to start pointing to the fact that God is going to use what looks like the weakest person and thing to rule everything. And that's his son and his death on the cross. Jesus looked weak. Jesus appeared weak. Jesus died on a cross like a criminal. He was beaten. He was dead, taken down, and buried. And God, in order to defeat his foes, <laughs> raised Jesus from the dead and has established him not only over all sheep and oxen and beasts of the field, and not only over the birds of the heavens and fish of the sea and whatever passes along the paths of the seas, but he has established his name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue con to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what the church saw in this passage. And it gave them great confidence to continue to proclaim Jesus and his resurrection, knowing that that foolish preaching about Christ and his resurrection was just like babies and infants, infants saying goo goo and gaga, and dad dad and mama, knowing that God will establish that gospel and that truth and that reality over all things, all people, all realms, at all times, in all generations. And so we're going to pray that, uh, I'll try to give you some things, you can pray whatever you want, but uh, that's just uh, some teaching about Psalm 8, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer, using our little guide here. And I think I am going to follow what Pam recommended to me, <laughs> and I'm going to get a chair. Because I had cramps in my legs last night, and I just think, if I sit down, <laughs> you may... You remember, you're going to be sitting there for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll turn the lights off and see you yeah. I would be perfectly fine. Oh, I can't oh, I can't even move the chair. I can't even. Oh, goodness. I'll be okay. I drank pickle juice today. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you uh, <clears throat> magnified yourself, most of all. We understand that there are some people who think that's uh, vanity or self-centeredness. But then uh, the other... Uh, aspect of that, which I've heard as well, what, what needs to be the highest uh, point of praise? And people get mad at God because he says, you know, uh, glorify me or uh, let the, you know, the heavens declare my glory. Uh, and so if it's not him, who's it going to be? And what we in, as sinful men want to do is we say, well, I want to be that person. We know it's not true. Uh, but why do we bother, uh, why does it bother us that God should deserve our praise and our uh, worship? And so direct us uh, to you, O oh Lord, uh, that we would value your glory above everything else. Psalm 8, 1. To the choir master, according to the Giddeth, the Psalm of David, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for how great
great you are. That you give us something glorious to look at, to ponder, to think about, to love, to pursue. Um, it's actually a great blessing uh, that you're as great as you are. And you want to remove all obstacles from our minds and our sight and our affections that we might be settled on you because you do not disappoint whereas everything else will if it's a part of this creation it will falter and fail to satisfy our everlasting longings we were made for you and you do us a great kindness to call us to yourself uh, we all have things that we think are beautiful. We all have things that we think are glorious and praiseworthy and worth our attention, our time, our efforts, uh, our expenses, our affections. But there is no one and no thing that compares with you. And so, Lord, uh, we just ask, would you give us the grace uh, and the understanding to value you above everything. And so may you be the one thing that we would sell everything in order to have. And by sell anything, I mean not only homes and bank accounts, but I mean our very lives and our other affections and our other treasures, would we give them away or give them up that we might have you? I ask it in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Psalm 8-2. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your, of your foes to steal the enemy and the adventure. Pray for God's enemies to be silenced by the weakest of people. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your great love, your mercy, your grace. We thank you that even before the heavens and earth were created, you had ordained your Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And Lord, when the first Adam fell, and sin entered the world, you promised that Christ would crush the head of the serpent. So Lord, from the very beginning, you have promised victory over Satan, sin and death. And you have provided for all who will believe access to Christ through his blood. We are cleansed such that we can come victorious in him to you. So Lord, we thank you that you chose to set your love upon us for Lord. We know that we were dead in our trespasses. Sinful. And you brought us forth out of darkness. Let us look to Samuel or Tiger and see the beauty of the innocence of those who love you with a pure heart. Such that, Lord, we can come before you and acknowledge that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and to shun evil is to show understanding. Such that we, your church, could be your obedient <coughs> servants to share the good news with those who are still captive.
captive to Satan, sin, and death, such that through your power and through your word that you might bring them victorious into the kingdom as well. For Lord, we can do nothing apart from you. For you are the all-powerful, ever-present, and all-knowing God of heaven and earth, the creator of everything, the sustainer, the God who is good and you do good. So we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for who you've called us to be, and for who you, the potter, are molding us into being. For Lord, we know that you are making us like Christ, and we are used we are to be used by you for your glory, through your strength. And all this is a wonderful gift from you. So thank you, Lord, that you do crush the head of the enemy each and every day as you grow your kingdom and you change us and make us more like you. In Jesus' name. Number three, pray that as we see God work by his finger, we will see how truly strong he is for us in Christ. Psalm 8, verses 3 through 4 say, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Father, it's not hard for us to understand majesty and glory in the earthly sense when, as these verses uh, have been read earlier, that we look outside in nature and we see things. We, many of us have been to very high mountains, very vast oceans. We've seen pictures of geysers or listed them. We've seen uh, evidences in weather that just boggle our imagination. And we've seen all different kinds of creatures and creations that you've made for us to take care of. But Father, uh, sometimes all of that gets in the way of us realizing and accepting and embracing the fact that you care individually for each and every one of us. And in our weaknesses, you are strong. You are there to help us in every situation, in every circumstance, in every need. I remember that the song that says, you meet us at the point of our knees when we are kneeling in prayer to you. Father, a lot of our um, mismanagement of your goodness comes from pride. Uh, we think that we can go it alone, that we don't need help for this or that. But the reality is, is that we need you every hour, just as Anthony was saying. We need you in every circumstance of our lives. And to think otherwise is for worry. So, Father, as we think about your greatness, your strength, your omnipotence, help us to also remember to come to you, to seek you each and every day, throughout the day, to rely on the things that you've given us, the sound minds and bodies, but also a willing heart to subject ourselves to your will, to obey what your word says, to try to love as you have demonstrated your love for us and to help others to see their very deep need for you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Number four, you grab your fancy and help us to delight in how you crown man with kind of glory and honor. Verse 5 says, Yet you have made a little more than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. We thank you that you have uh, this beautiful creation you've given us even in, in its fallen states and to have dominion over and uh, subdue and we just thank you for the 
Psalm chapter or Psalm chapter eight, verses six through eight. You have made him over the works of your hands, and all things you have placed under his feet, <clears throat> sheep and cattle, all of them, and also the wild animals of the field, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea, everything that passes along the paths of the sea. Lord, you said in your word through the Apostle Matthew in chapter 6 that you provide for all of creation, that the, the birds never, never go hungry and the flowers never toil nor stumble, and you clothe them, and you said that not even Solomon himself was more glorious than they were, and that you provide more you provide for them and how much more would you provide for us Lord you have shown through your creation and through us that you are sovereign you are in control of every circumstance no matter what we're going through whether a seed tumbles and tolls or whether it stays calm Lord you have absolute control over it whether the wind blows or whether it stands still, whether it's hot or whether it's cold, whether the earth spins or it stops in an instant, whether it moves one inch closer to the sun or one inch away, Lord, you have control over all of it and how the planets spin in their orbit. Lord, you sustain everything. And how foolish of us to think that that for some instance that you don't have control over all things just because of a little trial or a little circumstance that, that may throw us off kilter. Lord, let us see you in our, in our trials and our tribulations and our strugglings and our stumbles. Lord, let us understand that you have control over all of it. Let us not lose sight of that, that you are the sovereign Lord and you are in control. No matter who's in political office, no matter who's in government, no matter who's even in the church, Lord, Lord, you are in control. We thank you, Lord, for being the supreme <clears throat> ruler and being that you are. It should give us comfort and humble us to a degree that causes us to wake up every day with thankfulness because you give us breath in our lungs and you tell our heart to beat. And one day you can just tell it to stop. Lord, thank you for everything that you do for us. In Jesus' name. Majesty. Worship his majesty. And to Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom, authority, flow from the throne and to his own. An anthem raised, so exalt, lift up the high name of Jesus. Majesty, come glorify Jesus. The King, Majesty, worship His name. Jesus died, now glorified, King of all kings. Lord, as we close this part, we just pray for Your Majesty to be exalted in all the earth. Wherever the sun goes north to south, east to west. Let it declare your praise, your glory, your honor. Uh, let it declare your righteousness, uh, the fact that you are weighty and substantial, that you are to be reckoned with and dealt with, but that you're also gracious and loving and kind. And you offer salvation and peace with all men and women through Jesus Christ. So we ask that you would uh, 
change hearts, change minds, uh, draw all unto yourself for your name's sake and our good. We pray in Jesus' name.